Hey everybody, Scout Crafter here again. It's Mishmash Monday, as you can see. Been very busy. You can see I put up a new fence. Had to take down one of the wild cherry trees and uh, do a lot of trimming. It's breaking my heart. I hate to cut any trees, but when you live this close to somebody, and let me tell you something about fences. Good fences make good neighbors. I didn't make that up, but that has to be one of the truest statements I ever heard. Anyway, uh, we're gonna do a little something different today because it's so nice out. It's a beautiful day. I think I'm gonna spend the night upstate, sleep out, uh, maybe under the stars. It's a little chilly up there, but we'll see what we're gonna do. And uh, I want to try out a light, or show you a light that I made, I guess, a few years ago. Let's now, check it. Obviously, this is the Scoutcraft Mobile, and if you're looking at the uh, door here, You'll see uh, on both doors I have uh, an insignia and the extra points if you could figure out what that insignia One is. One nice thing about having a trailer hitch is it's so versatile. There's so many things you could do with it. Let me show you one of the things that uh, that I designed for this trailer now, this hitch. This is a flagpole holder or something that goes into the back. I don't even know exactly what this is used for, but you can see there's a tube up here and then there's a regular shift that goes into your trailer hitch. and. Uh, I, uh, you could put flag poles, you could put all kinds of things in there, and it's really useful. Ago, I made this out of some uh, scrap plywood, and you can see what it is. It's four LED lights that are positioned around the, a little box that I made, and this hole will slip over a piece of PVC uh, pipe. I have this running off of 110, and the reason I did that is I could run it off my generator or something, or I can use it on a different pole, but uh, we're going to go upstate where it's real dark and try this out on a piece of... Uh, pipe that I made specifically for the truck and see how it okay, does. Okay, we made it up here. It's now midnight. It took us about uh, three and a half hours to get up here. We hit an hour's worth of traffic. Some motorhome went on fire and they closed the road, but now I'm up here and uh, it's a beautiful night, crystal clear, tons of stars. I have the uh, Larry light, you could see here, illuminating. <laughs> That's what's illuminating me, just sitting on top of the car. Uh, the big Larry, but I'm going to show you now what that light looks like on the back of the okay, vehicle. Okay, here's the result of the light. You can see it's uh, the, actually the video darkens a little bit, but I'm about 20 feet from the uh, my little cabin, and, and you can see here that uh, it does illuminate the area all the way around. And, and you'll see, I'll put a picture in the back. Uh, the photograph shows the real how how it looks in real time, but. Uh, it really does work out nice. It's a great little light to have. You could drive with it, and it only uses 40 watts because those are uh, 10 watt, less than 10 watts each one. So it uh, it does a great. Now here's a more accurate view of what it actually looks like because it's a photograph. You can see it's much lighter. Okay, we are back, back home, back in the shop, and uh, trying to still straighten my back out from sleeping on that cot. Oh, the cots kill me. Anyway. Uh, there's one thing I want to get to real quick, and that is, uh, we have a, if you notice the comments, uh, we have some of the best subscribers on this channel of any channel that I go on. And, uh, there is a wealth of information. There are some really smart guys out there that watch this. I think they watch it just for the, just because it's a goof to them to see some, me, some guy monkeying around in the shop. But uh, if you if you aren't reading the comments, I really suggest that just you know pass through a few. You're going to see there's some really bright people out there, and they really help out and then chime in with some uh, information. But uh, one thing I just want to say: if you find a comment and it has a lot of good information in it, click the little thumbs up arrow on that comment because what it does is it moves it up into the rank of comments. So if somebody, if 10 people like that comment, that'll be the first one to show up and everybody will get to see it because a lot of people don't want to read through all the comments. So uh, if you can, if you like a comment and you think it's really useful, give it a thumbs now, up. Now, as you know, I do read all the comments and uh, I do appreciate everyone and everyone that watches. And um, one of uh, my subscribers, Ronaldo, who, uh, who's been a subscriber for a long time, he's just a great guy. And uh, it turns out Ronaldo's a, a padlock collector like I am. And uh, he's been leave, leaving good comments for such a long time. I said, you know what? I want to do this uh, little segment just for Ronaldo. We, we like to talk lock collectors. We like to talk about locks to each other. So uh, I just want to show you something. I think you'll you know, find I interesting. I have a pretty awesome padlock collector. I started collecting when I was a kid. I had like six locks and thought it was a lot. But then when I, I, I don't know, a few years ago, I got really heavily into it. I started really... Uh, getting some of the ones I always like and these are called 
Uh, these are called push locks or commonly known as pancake locks because they're flat. And uh, you'll see this one's a very popular one, the Champion. And, and what they are is basically it's a, a padlock that uh, uses a push key. And this is what a push key, it's a flat key. And uh, what you would do is you, you see it's got a little here, you grip it like this and there's a little slot in the bottom. You see that slot? And what you do is you push it in like this and you just push it forward and it pops right open. Now, uh, for anybody you're getting into uh, lock collecting, this is the way I do it, but um, you should never leave your key in the lock. You know, always uh, tie it to a piece of cord or something and, and wrap it around, but never leave the key in the lock because it weakens the, uh, the, the tumblers and pins. But isn't that a cool lock, how that works? And I remember 1870 about these locks came into the into play and they still work and they still have a great design to it and the beauty of it is you know you can't there's not too much way to get to the shackle like if you want to cut you know this would be the weak point of the lock and you know um because the body is so robust around here you know it was a little harder to get to but uh 100 year 150 year old lock and look it still works like the day it was uh like the day it was made, you know, it's just a beautiful, all these locks are really now, nice. Now, the one exception to these type pancake locks is this one here used a turn key. So it was still a flat key, but instead of a push type, you would uh, push this in like this and just give it a turn like a normal lock. And then it would spring open like that. And, uh, and then again to close it. And this one here was made, uh, you know, like of a sheet or stamp metal type, you know, it was a little bit less expensive, but uh, still they're just, these things, it's funny because uh, everybody, a lot of people like these locks, you know, you, when you say, wow, that's something cool to have, be cool to put in the drawer, whatever is show and tell. But, um, every year they seem to go up a little bit because more people find them interesting. That's what you want to invest in. If you're going to get into the lock collecting, you want to get locks that people find interesting generation after generation, you know, not something that's just, uh, you know, that's a fan. So, Ronaldo, uh, that was for you. I hope you enjoyed it, buddy. I hope you uh, have a padlock, uh, a pancake lock or two in your collection. And uh, they're a lot of fun. Uh, next up, I know we're finished with Knife Week. Uh, I do, you know, the people that love them really love them. The people that don't, you know, they're like, ah, not so much. But uh, I really enjoy it. Let me show you one last one. Uh, I'm, I brought it down to clean up. I'm not going to go through it today. But uh, this is something that... You know, this is something your great-grandfather would pass down Now, to. again, like I said, we're finished with Knife Week. But look, is this not a beautiful knife? This is a marbles knife. The original marbles from uh, made from... Uh, it's in Gladstone, Michigan. And uh, look at this. This is uh, this pattern goes back to about uh, the mid-1900, like early 1910, 1915, around there. A lot of them you'll see as far as 1919. But this uh, pattern goes way back. And it's such a classic pattern, isn't it? It has, they call it like a Skinner type, but... Uh, I love this. It's the, the balance, the feel. The handle's a little bit short for me, but it's okay because, uh, you know, I can grip around here. But it's got the little serrations on the back here of the blade to put your thumb if you're going to do anything. Uh, some guy had this. He made a little mark on here. He must have had this for many years. It's still got the, you know, leather-wrapped handle. It's nice and tight. And uh, I just came down to clean it up a little bit. But I want to show you because uh, this is something that would be passed down from the grandfather to grandson and just a, a beautiful, well-made knife. And it's uh, over a hundred years old and still, you know, works just the way it should have when it was Okay, made. next up on the Mosh, a few months ago, I did a wrench that uh, some people, you either loved it or hated it. I, this wrench I love, and I got to show it to you and, and uh, get your opinion okay, on it. Okay, you know I'm a big fan of monkey wrenches or auto wrenches. I just can't get enough of them, although I never use them. They're kind of useless tools. They, you, you know, nobody's going to take one of these out if you have a. <laughs> but I just like them, so it's kind of a, a little section of history that passed and, and I got caught up in. This one here is, is a Wakefield, and you can see here it's a number 19, uh, patent date of 1922. And uh, it was made in Massachusetts. And uh, the funny thing is that I did this one here. And I bought this specifically to to do another one of these. I, I made, This was a, a wrench that I did a while ago. And, and um, I every time I open my drawer of tools, this thing just stares at me. And it just, I said, wow. I said, that thing, it went from an ugly, rusty old wrench. I said, now this thing stands out. It's like, wow, look at me. It's... I don't know. I, I just like it, right, for some reason. But my uh, mentor, Dan, said to me, he says, you know what you should have did? 
when you drill the holes, you should have made, you know, because it's it's a useless wrench otherwise, and the holes do, don't weaken it any because uh, of just the way they're placed, but what you should have did, he said, was uh, make them threaded holes, so this way you could use it like a thread gauge, you know, and, and I said, wow, that was a great idea, so I was looking for another one, and I was going to do the the holes going up as and and tap and thread them, so this way the, the wrench could be useful as a uh, thread or a tap gauge, right? But, and then I get this in the mail, and I'm looking at this, I said, you know, I collect a lot of these, the flatter type, but this one is so much thicker than any of the other ones I saw. I mean, look at the thickness comparison here. Uh, it's almost double. And, uh, I mean, that's some heavy-duty wrench. And I said, this is interesting. And the beauty of it is when you unscrew this all the way, that the wrench, I don't have to worry about. Some of them get locked up down here that you can't take them off. Well, this one will, when you unscrew it all the way, will come off the bottom. So that makes for an even easier restoration. The only problem is when restoring a wrench like this is that uh, you, you have to work around here unless you want to drill out the rivets. That makes no sense. So, you know, you won't be able to get the, the wheel out. But I came down here to clean this up today and then try and decide what I want to do. But it is a beautiful wrench. Okay, here we are at a post wire brush evaluation and uh, I have to tell you, you need one of those soft wire brushes in order to get into like the knurled section here. If I didn't have a soft one, I never would have, you know, the hard one just don't cut it. And also the grooves here, things like that, gets all the rust out. The tubular wire brushes got into through here, got all the rust out of there. And then I knocked down with a hammer. The little bulging that was happening on the side, I just uh, knocked that down. But I'm also going to take that and, and use the sander. But funny story here. You can see here the Wakefield. And now you can see here. Now over here, I was doing a strap wrench restoration once. <laughs> and I said it was well, from Worcester, Massachusetts. And uh, oh, it was embarrassing. One of the, the subscribers, he said, yeah, it's, it's Wooster. And I was like, oh, man, I should have known that. Wooster. But it don't look like Wooster, right? The way that's spelt. <laughs> anyway, so now I got to uh, decide what I'm going to do. But definitely want to do clean up. Look at this here. Somebody took a hammer and was beating on that, right? That's pretty bad. That's pretty deep. Now you say, oh, geez, what can you do about that? Look how deep it is. Well, that's when you got to decide. Are you going to leave it? I can't leave it. He's got to go deeper. You got to go deeper. It's the only way you could do. Or you can fill it in with some weld. Ain't going to do that. Let's get over to the sand. Now, believe it or not, one, these wrenches look very simple to do, but they are far from it because there's a lot of little tricky uh, areas to get into to uh, to do the wrench up right. And you can see we're getting the jaw pretty much straightened out. But this little area up here, you see, this is, you know, the difference between just, you know, cleaning it up and wire brushing it and doing a, a you know, a tribute wrench. And here it is. You can see that that line there, the forger. That's very difficult to get in there. And look at all these pits. And that that's a hard one to get. But um, using the stick, the little uh, pressure stick behind the belt, and that's why this is really important. I, it was a little longer when I started, but you see the boat tail design I have on both sides here? You do that on the belt sander. So you just take a stick and you, you get it down here. Now you could press behind the belt and get into them areas like here. I'm, the belt. Imagine the belt between the stick and the uh, wrench, and I'm pushing the edge of that belt along this edge here to get it to uh, to that to look like that. So this is this saves you. Those platens that come with it are great for certain things, but not for what we do. And uh, and then you see here, you know, you want to try and take it easier on this section. This one's in real good shape because you don't want the wrench rattling too much. But you can see we got 90% of that uh, the pitting out of the back there, and we're not finished yet. That's just the course belt. Now you know my favorite part, remember what the wrench looked like before we started. And we are calling this project done. Boy, uh, I don't know what it is about these foolish wrenches that make me like them so much. But you can see here we filled in the red. It's still a little bit wet because I just finished it. But uh, look at all the pot, all of the sides and the top. And it is a 
mirror finish throughout, except I did leave the original texture here that was on this piece because, you know, the belt really can't get in those little spots, but uh, it is super smooth. You know, uh, did the, the tips match up perfectly now because, you know, you can grind them together, but uh, very smooth. Didn't even oil it yet, and it's still smooth, and it's just, and this is a, one of my favorite parts. The back here, see that back, how that, they usually just cut it off at kind of like an angle, and I love to just do that that on the back of it. But anyway, uh, and we did get rid of 99% uh, of, you see, just a little bit there of residual, but, you know, nothing worth going nuts over. This is a, a good wrench, a beautiful wrench, and uh, I didn't do anything with this one here. What's interesting is here, you can see here, the they stamped on this side of the wrench, and they stamped on an opposite, but... Aren't they nice wrenches? I don't know what it is. I guess the poor man's wrench restoration channel. Anyway, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this one. Take care now. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.